So, not really sure how interesting this video will be, but I thought I'd attempt to make a video showing really, well, and talking also about what the difference between a big PA system and kind of your DJ PA system. At least attempt to try and get across what separates the two, really what kind of the differences are from the point of view of how you manage the higher powers on the big PA system. Um, so I don't actually unfortunately have any small DJ style speakers here to show um, but you would have seen them everywhere any kind of sort of disco mobile DJ kind of party type thing um, often it will be a pair of speakers on a couple of tripods that sort of thing and so they're usually self-contained some of them have got built-in amplifiers and all you need to do is just supply them with a bit of power and an audio signal some of the slightly more complex systems may have digital signal processing and limiters uh, i.e. to try and offer some kind of protection from people overdriving them that kind of thing um, the more expensive ones may have that a lot of them are now digital um, not necessarily because digital is better but at that kind of scale digital is often cheaper um, they're smaller they're lighter and they're actually a bit more efficient uh, and really these days you can't really tell much difference in sound quality between them so when you get beyond an event like that where you've just got speakers on sticks and you need to look into something a bit more powerful um, ultimately you could end up going in a kind of same sort of direction as this so you need to cover more people uh, as I've sort of said, these speakers on sticks, you can stick subs under them as well. So you could have a couple of subs, uh, it might be by the DJ or front of house or on a stage, and those will enhance the low frequency, uh, give kind of greater impact for more people. Um, but you get to a point where really that kind of system doesn't work and you need to scale up. And one of the more common ways in doing so is with something pretty similar. Uh, to what we have here, and what I'm just wandering around aimlessly pointing the camera at. So, straight away, you can see the size of this thing. Um, it's a little bit dusty because they haven't been cleaned yet. We're just bringing them out of their winter kind of event hibernation, and now they're going to get ready to go out for the summer, various events around the southeast. Um, and we have here is one of our kind of we call it the festival uh, i think i call it festival m if you like well this is almost an l uh basically we've got four tops four subs uh now with a system like this you could cover depending on size of tent easily uh you know 700 people not a problem probably more to be fair um we did that last summer in a marquee, a, a large marquee, sort of 30 metres long, 12 metres wide. And um, actually this exact system is what we had in there. Four subs, four tops. And um, it was way more than we needed. It was absolutely fine. No dramas whatsoever. So when you're driving speakers this sort of size, you need a fair amount of power behind it. And um, again... Uh, bass speakers with built-in amplifiers exist um, but more commonly even these days you'll find a separate amp rack now you'll end up with a, a set of amplifiers that will do the top speakers and the amplifier doing bass speaker and then obviously what you need to do is manage out all the signals so that you're sending bass to the low speakers and, and so on and that's where we have a processor come in such as this here now the power involved with these kind of amplifiers, let's put this in some sort of perspective. So these bass speakers are around 3,600 watts or so each. I think it might be 3,200. Um, and there's four of them. That's fairly significant. That's, you're talking more than, you need an amplifier that's capable of driving more than 12,000 watts. Uh, probably more in the order of sort of 15, 16, something like that. Um, the way we manage this is actually on a rig like this where I haven't got the amplifier here that would do that 
um, but we'd use two of these and this rack is just set up for one just for convenience really because so many uh, events that's actually fine and if we need more I can just sit another one out with this setup. So this amplifier there's 12,000 watt amplifier that will actually drive all four subs fine um, but to get the most out of them with the most potential we'd use two of them um, and the amplifier's just a bit happier it just takes a bit of strain off that amplifier there and the top speakers in a similar vein so behind this grill you've got a 12 inch driver there a six inch mid there and a one inch compression driver actually the six is horn loaded as well so you kind of got uh your mid high frequency section and your low mid section now that needs several amplifiers just to run that uh, and the way we have this configured is what we call bi amping we have one amplifier that deals with the upper end and another amplifier for the lower end and that's why we've got these two amplifiers here this drives the 12 inches and this drives the six and the one now you could if you really felt like it split this into a three-way system where you'd have an amplifier for the mids an amplifier for the six an amplifier for the one however due to the nature of high frequency speakers you do not need as much energy for the hf section as you do for the low frequency section so you can get over using a, internal crossovers without any problem whatsoever and so it just saves another amplifier really i mean i i'm kind of fond of these amplifiers they're a couple of years old now but they're full-on well we call them crown uh, itex and they're class i which is proprietary to crown they're in the patents for that so you don't find them in anything else um, I've done other videos on the amps, so I'm not going to go into any too much more detail about them, but I get them with them very well. They're astonishingly powerful, and under load, they're also really efficient. Uh, yeah, so, again, with a, a setup like this, you need a fairly hefty main supply. And in this case, we've got power coming in from a 32-amp supply you cannot really well no you i know for a fact because i've tried it you cannot run this from a 13 amp main socket you'll quickly blow the fuse on just this amp alone in short order if you're trying to run four subs that is not going to end well um what we have managed to do though on smaller setups is using two bass speakers and four tops and we've managed to get that working on we use that for a few outdoor events throughout the year off a single 13 amp but if you really want to do a dance kind of event or bass heavy yeah normally we feed this from generators um and so yeah the crossover at the top uh this system sort of slightly split up a split as to how i've organized it uh this audio processor here is kind of a bit of a classic now um you know, these are highly respected when they're new. Um, I'm not sure how old they are. This one is probably one of the last ones they made of the series. So it's a three channel in, uh, six channel out, uh, full DSP control over that. And the way this works is, if I turn the unit on, the unit will boot. And on the screen, it will just show you kind of a visual representation of what's going on with the uh, crossover points so that you can see what's kind of at a glance how it's configured there we go so we have our low frequency our mid and high so you know just by glance that it's a three-way uh, configuration we use a and b as our left and right channel inputs and then the way we group our channels is we have low mid and high they're joined together there's no reason to configure these as six independent channels when two of them essentially doing the same thing they're just left or right um, and then you have the neat little kind of trim for each channel where if you just want a bit more an environment calls for a bit more bass or even a bit less or a bit more high frequency or mid we can just tweak them as we go so other things that you have to be aware of with any kind of system like this is due to the power of the amplifiers uh, it's crucial that you only ever send a clean signal into them or you risk sending what's called dc out to your speakers and if there's one thing direct current dc does is it loves heating stuff up really quickly and you're going to end up with uh, your speakers burnt out before you know what's going on 
So that's important about putting a clean signal into the left and right channels in the first place. But also, you have to be careful about very loud signals going into the uh, processor um, that are clean but might saturate the, the, the processor itself or potentially produce outputs from the processor to cause uh, a level that's too high that kind of exceeds the input capability of the amps. And we deal with that by using limiters. And all that is, there's kind of a two-stage limiter on this system. Uh, well, in fact, there's no, there's more. There's two stages on this, and the amplifiers have their own as well. So the way this works is, this has a kind of a, a, a nice uh, limiter that's not too audible, but if you go beyond that too harsh, then you have what's called a brick wall limiter, and that is a, literally the signal is not going louder than this, no matter what you do. And um, you may hear that as compression coming out. Now, the amplifiers themselves have their own built-in limiters, but these are a bit more clever. So they're able to monitor the voltage and the watts. It can measure that via current volts uh, going to each speaker. And you can set limiters within this so that you don't provide too much voltage to speakers. And that is what limits how much the cone moves. So we call that excursion. If you put too much voltage into a speaker, uh, you can go beyond what's called the X max, and that can damage the suspension and basically a continual use of that long term is going to ruin suspension kind of you could break you got you kind of it's like over revving an engine it's you know it's not good for it it's going to do damage ultimately uh, and but that be picked up as physical mechanical damage so by putting in voltage limiters and all these amplifiers can do that internally that kind of means anything beforehand regardless as to what's going on with this unit you're not going to exceed that and your speakers are protected but then you have also your uh, so that would deal with transients, kind of sudden one-offs. You also have a, a more long-term limiter, and that's done by uh, limiting the amount of watts that get fed into a speaker. So there's two ways you can burn a speaker out. One is, um, well, I suppose there's three. DC is going to do that very quickly, very quickly indeed. A 1,000-watt speaker, if you put a DC of 200 watts for it, or even probably 100 watts, after a few hours, it's not going to be happy. Um, it's the kind of your average uh, in that instance the DC uh, wattage is just simply burnt off as heat and that is manifests itself in just melting the coil and that's not going to end well so we can limit the voltage as I've just said but this is able to monitor the amount of watts going to the speaker in order to do that these amplifiers can also monitor the load so they have built-in load monitoring uh, monitoring and they can send a, this connected to a network we've got uh, a network port on there and it's got a switch inside which joins this all together um, and so we can monitor remotely the speaker load uh, and that's actually interesting in some cases because if you've been driving the speakers quite hard you can see the um, impedance of the speakers that's the resistance so that's proportional to heat uh, you know you heat up a piece of metal its resistance increases and that's no different to a speaker in a coil so you can actually, and it's called power compression actually. So, if you drive the speakers too hard, they heat up, the output drops. You try and drive them harder, uh, and then the kind of you follow this chain where eventually you just burn the speaker out. Not through clipping, not through necessarily over voltage in them, but simply because you've provided too much long-term power that exceeds the thermal capacity of the speaker to cool itself. Uh, so, in order to try and keep an eye of what's going on, we can limit the amount of watts that is fed to each speaker, and we can also set the, the amplifiers to provide a warning should the impedance of the speakers go out of range. Um, and these kind of combined together provide a fairly decent protection system for the whole PA. It's not um, perfect, none of these things are. You want to be able to get as much out of the system as you possibly can, obviously to cover as many people as you can for the smallest amount of PA possible, it just makes sense. Um, but you don't want to be replacing speaker cones and doing all sorts of other damage. Um, so pretty much, I think, I haven't spoken much about cables yet, so other than the main supply. So speaker cables again 
um, these ones have four wires going down each one so uh, these feed the base these feed the top and if I can pull this one out a little bit tricky because there's not much room so there we go so these are called Speakons. This is an industry standard. They're really great, actually. Um, four wires in here. So this allows uh, two audio channels from the pair of amplifiers to go down one wire to power one speaker. So in they go like that. Um, and yeah, you have to, the, the tops aren't so much of a problem because the amount of power going down them uh, sort of you're talking a thousand watts for the mid and maybe 300 watts for the high frequency mid high frequency section uh, the base is a different matter you know you're talking three kilowatts um, or even more if you've got two subs on each of these wires it's best to keep them as short as possible it's always pays where it can be done to put the amplifiers as near to the speakers as possible use the shortest speaker cables um, and uh, obviously the signal wires really don't matter if they're 100 meters it's not going to make any difference um, power needs to be considered if you're doing long runs there you might have thicker cables um, or use higher amperage cables and then go to a distro and drop it down reality is that's never been a problem for us but it's something just to be aware of um, uh, the bottom is just an exact rep replica of the top um, this is half the system, so you can drag out more if needs be. Let's have a quick look around the back if I can. Not really anything to see. Um, shows the audios in and this links through to the top. So we can actually connect four tops if we were felt the need to one output channel per side. The amplifiers are quite capable of doing that. And two subs per side if we had to off one amp rack. We wouldn't normally do that. Uh, we'd spread the load out a little bit more, just as it gives us more control. So I think really that's 17 minutes or so of waffling about um, larger scale PA systems, I suppose. Um, this one will be on hire for all sorts of places and parties and mini festivals and things over the summer. And uh, we've just pulled it out now, getting it ready for that. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed this short video. If you did, feel free to subscribe and uh, give it a like and we'll look at uploading more in the near future.